Hey guys, sorry, we just had some issues there. Um, so, I'm Hayden, and tonight I'm going to be talking to you about an accident that I had in 2008 where I dislocated my neck in a truck accident. Um, I did have a slideshow to show you, but we won't be using that now. Um, so, I was driving a truck on Pennant Hills Road in Sydney when I was involved in an accident with another truck where I was at fault. I clipped the back of the truck and then I went into a big sandstone brick wall. With all the bouncing around and the impact, I dislocated my neck at C5, C6. Um, I, was truck, I was stuck in the truck for about an hour while the paramedics and fire brigade tried to find a way to get me up. Um, I ended up doing this by cutting the roof off the truck and basically cutting the truck to pieces to get me up. Um, from there, I was transported by road to Westmead Hospital where after x-rays and scans, they confirmed that I had dislocated my neck um, at C5, C6. Um, I was operated on that day by Dr. Andrew Camp, um, and I had C5, C6 fused. Um, I was there for a couple of days, and while I was at Westmead, I had my lung collapse. Um, so I was put on, um, I had to basically breathe through a mask. Um, if I wasn't on the mask, it would be really laboured breathing, and I just didn't feel well. Um, due to this, <coughs> I wasn't able to be transported via helicopter, which I was actually looking forward to at the time because with everything going on, I thought a nice helicopter ride up to Royal North Shore would have been a bit of fun. Um, but I ended up being transported by road up to Royal North Shore Spinal Unit, um, where after a couple of days, they confirmed, they came to me and confirmed that they believed that I'd be a C5 quadriplegic for the rest of my life. So that meant no movement from my triceps down, very limited hand movement, no feeling from my chest down. Um, it meant that I would have been in a powered, more like, most likely a powered wheelchair for the rest of my life and I wouldn't have been capable of doing a lot of things independently, no showering, no toileting, um, and it makes it hard to go places. Um, the one memory I have of being told that this was gonna happen was me kind of just laughing at the doctor and telling him that this wasn't going to happen and I was going to walk out of here. Um, I wasn't going to let what he thought dictate what I did. So that was my goal the whole time, was to be able to walk out of hospital and prove the doctor wrong. Um, while I was at Royal North Shore, after about two or three weeks, I got, hand, I got moving back in my right hand, um, which was a really good sign that everything was kind of as the swelling was going down, that I was going to get a bit more feeling and move them back. Um, but at that stage, they still didn't think it was going to be much. <coughs> um, a bit after that, as as it was a spinal unit, they were they had morning rounds and they were they were a teaching hospital, so they had um, some doctors come around and ask if I mind having the interns kind of look at me and do an assessment, and I had no problem with it. Um, it was during this assessment that. <coughs> they noticed that one of my toes in my right leg was moving um which was it's really hard to describe the excitement that was in the room that day um i had qto after that and they kind of went through and did some more tests and we realized that i'd got a bit more feeling back <coughs> and my pain reception in my leg had returned and i was getting a little bit more movement than just in the toes um, this kind of happened gradually over the next couple of weeks um, to the point where by the time I left Royal North Shore I was able to stand with the assistance of some machines and people helping me. Um, the one other thing about Royal North Shore that I remember is how much support I had from everyone. I had friends there all the time, every night there was people there visiting me, every weekend there were people there visiting me and it really, it means a lot to somebody that's in hospital and it's been through an accident to just have people sit there with you and talk to you and not make you feel like it's the end of the world and to push you when you need to be pushed. Because there were definitely days that I didn't want to go to OT or I didn't want to go to physio but there was no getting better unless I did and they were there to keep me in line. Um, after a while at Royal North Shore, I got moved to Royal Ride Rehab, where I went to Muron, which is their, which was their spinal unit at the time. <clears throat> um, by the time I got there, I was 
yeah, able to stand by myself and it was pretty clear that I was going to have some good, a, a better outcome than what was expected. They didn't know how much I was going to get or whether I was going to leave being able to walk a little bit, walk with a four wheel walker. <clears throat> um, so there was still definitely a lot to do there. Um, <clears throat> one thing about being in the rehab center was you've got a lot of time to do nothing. And it's really hard to continue pro continue getting progress when you've got so much time just to sit there and think about everything that can go wrong. So Monday to Friday, I had an hour of physio, an hour of OT, Breakfast was at 7.30, lunch was at 12.30, and dinner was at 6.30, and everything else in that time was free time. Um, I was lucky, I was from Western Sydney as it was, so it wasn't too far for people to come and visit me. So I had a lot of people come visit me, spend time with me and just kind of hang out. Um, I was also able to go and get out to see my friends out at different events. So I went to an RFS day, an RFS, a rural fire service field day. Um, I went to a Muay Thai fight night. Um, I went to a dinner. I, I kind of got out of there whenever I could. Um, everything was going really well at the rehab center. I was getting more muscle. I was able to do more. I was able to um, walk with the aid of people. Um, in the rehab center, there was 25 people in the unit. Um, I was the only one that was able to walk. Um, so I kind of became a target for people that were upset and felt that I had been given more than what they had. Um, so there were times where people were running into me with their powered wheelchairs or um, that organized events and I'd purposely not be, be invited. Um, which really started to kind of take a hit to my mental health um, my mental health really started to struggle about 14 or 15 weeks in. So after you come out of spinal shock, you're, you're catheterized the whole time up until that point. And then after that time, they take the catheter out and they really start to get you to um, try voiding by yourself and see how it goes. And it starts off like just small amounts and you've got to try all different medications. And um, it was around this time that when you're trialing the medications and you're asleep, you don't really have any control over your body. So I started to have, um, started bedwetting, um, which took a huge, huge toll on my self-confidence because as a 20 year old that had no under no real understanding of medical stuff, as soon as I started walking, I figured everything would just go back to normal. I'd walk out of rehab, I'd go back to driving trucks, I'd go back to being at the gym five days a week, getting, preparing to fight, I'd be, jumping on the up, like going back out with the rural fire brigade, going to fire calls and MBAs and just being able to go back to life. Um, and it was around this time that I realized that just wasn't going to happen. Um, I kind of started to withdraw myself a little bit um, and started to get down about what was gonna happen. Um, I still kept focusing on my muscle recovery and getting out of rehab and walking. Um, but it also became a lot easier to when I went up to the pub on a Friday night with everyone to kind of get blind drunk and make an idiot of myself and just kind of drink everything away. <clears throat> so drinking and substance abuse had been a part of my life before the accident and after the accident. It's how I went back to coping. So I'd used them in the past to cope for things that had happened to me in my teenage years during um, my time with the Rural Fire Service and um, events that had happened at school. So I thought that was the best way to continue doing it. It was just to drink until I had no more feelings. <clears throat> um, when I left, just before I left Royal Ride Rehab, I had the physio that was, that was dealing with me stop my treatment. Um, and this wasn't anything to do with me not needing, the excuse she gave was that I didn't need any more treatment and other people needed more treatment. but. Everyone in the rehab center knew it was because of my behavior outside and some, an action that was in a gray area that I did with, um, with people on the, on site. Um, so I'd had troubles with the physio the whole time and just never got it on and I didn't really want her as my physio and I'd asked to change physios, but being in the rehab setting, they refused to change 
my physio um, and it hindered my my recovery because I wasn't really putting in as much effort as I could have and she definitely wasn't putting in as much effort or pushing me or changing the exercises that, that I needed. Um, so I left, so about that time, my grandmother was my biggest supporter. She was always there for me. She never seemed to judge me before my accident, definitely didn't judge me afterwards. Um, and she actually passed away while I was in the rehab center, which was really hard to deal with. I wasn't ready to let her go. She, it, it sounds selfish, but I was not prepared at all for her to pass on. And I definitely wasn't prepared for the feelings that came with it afterwards. So my drinking increased both when I returned home on a weekend and both, and when I went to the pub. Um, and I was also sneaking out of the rehab center on a daily basis to go down to a buy a six pack and then I'd just drink it and then head back to the rehab center. Um, when I left the rehab center, I returned home with minor renovations to the house and new showers and new staircases. So there was nothing major really done. Um, but I felt like I was an intruder in my own house. <clears throat> I hadn't been there for six months. People had gone on with their lives, things had changed and I just didn't, I didn't feel like me. So I didn't feel like I belonged in the house. Um, there's nothing anyone did, but that's just how I felt. I, I wouldn't leave the house though. I'd have some severe anxiety when I left the house. And whenever I did leave the house, I just tried to go to the gym or I was back at work in the October after having the accident in March. Um, and that was really the only kind of places that I went. Um, and even doing that, there was so much pain involved because standing up and walking more than a hundred meters was just so difficult. Um, as I kind of continued to allow my mental health to decline, I started to go to the pub a bit more, which was the only other place that I'd go. And I'd just get, I would write myself off. There's no other way to describe it. I just drink until all my feelings went away, all the pain went away. I don't know how I got home most of the time. I don't know what I did most of the time. Um, so instead of coming to terms with my emotion or my injury, I just drank it away, um, which then led back into the substance abuse of speed and MDMA. Because when I was on them, I felt great. I felt happy, I felt loved, I felt excited. And it was just the boost in all the serotonin and the chemicals that it releases that I now know. Um, I went back to work two days, four hours, and then three days, eight hours, and slowly built up to full time. Um, the whole time I was really hesitant to do it, and I kept saying to my doctor, I'm really struggling, I'm really struggling. But every time the insurance company asked him to increase hours, he would increase the hours. Um, <coughs> So as this happened, my mental health continued to decline to the point where I just became really, really withdrawn, really aggressive and really short with people. And I just had no time for anything. Um, the medication, the side effects of the medication were horrible. I'd have um, really short term memory loss. I'd be fatigued um, and it was just, I felt so different and I didn't have the coping mechanisms to do that. Um, uh, in about 2010, I continued drinking and severely using alcohol as a way to get through stuff. I then started a relationship with my first, with my second girlfriend since being out of rehab. Um, and I pushed away a lot of good friends at this point. I don't know why I did it. I know there was, some of the reason was that I was embarrassed of everything that was still happening with me. I'd go out in public and my bladder was still playing up. So I'd often have leakage or I'd really need to know where the toilet was um, in a hurry. And I just didn't want to admit this to my friends. I didn't want to, admit to anyone that I was still wetting the bed at 21 years old. Um, it just seemed embarrassing, but, <clears throat> and I didn't want to want to use the medical excuse for it happening. Um, it was during this time that 
I definitely withdrew from everyone. I, know, I just basically was with my girlfriend all the time. It became a very toxic relationship and a very tough place to be. Um, and in the December, just before the Christmas, I was at a Christmas party at my parents' place while I was still with her. Um, and I had an incident with my mum where I'd been, so I'd still been living at home on and off, but I'd been mainly living with a girlfriend. Um, and I had an incident with my mother where she told me to get off the property and never return. So I did, I packed my bags, I left, and I went to the girlfriend's house. Um, and it was really difficult to lose my biggest support network. So I basically, from then, I didn't talk to, my, I didn't talk to any of my family. I just went, lived with my girlfriend and had my girlfriend and that was it. Um, we, I felt, and it came to the November and I just felt really trapped. So one day she went out, I packed up and I left. Didn't tell her I was leaving, had no interest in telling her I was leaving and I just left. Um, I packed everything into my car, bought a case of beer, drove to my parents' house to drop some stuff off to my brother, um, started drinking on the way and my plan was just to drink and drive as far as I could and just get away and never return. Um, it was at this point my dad seen me and told my grandfather and I ended up moving with my grandfather from there who only lived down the road who has always been really supportive of me. Um, the living with my grandfather was, was good but it increased my drinking even more so every night I'd be drinking and I'd gone from beer to whiskey um, and drinking spirits which increased my bedwetting which decreased my self-esteem and so I drank more and then it was just a toxic, toxic cycle that I'd got myself into and I only had myself to blame. Um, I'd started, I'd asked my doctor about my mental health at that point but he kind of just shrugged it off as like, oh you're alright, you're, you're 21, you'll be fine, just tough it out kind of thing. Um, he referred me to a psychologist which I didn't put any effort into and I only seen him like four or five times before I just stopped showing up because I didn't want to be there and he wasn't really, he didn't seem to be helping me, it probably was, but I didn't seem to be. Um, it was around this time though that I started working and I stopped all my medication when I started working. I just thought, now I'm working, I'm going to stop seeing doctors, I'm going to stop taking my medication, I'm just going to focus on being fit and healthy and that's what I'll be. Um, so I'd gone from not working for six months or so to working overnight 40 hours a week and then I picked up a second job during the day. So at one point for two months I was working 80 hour weeks. So I'd work 40 hour nights, 40 hour days, which is just crazy. I was struggling so much, I was in so much pain. So I'd started using substances to get me through the day and to make me feel better and that increased when I wasn't at work and the drinking increased when I wasn't at work. There was a day there where I slept for like 36 hours because I was so tired. Um, the one good thing that came from this is that I quit one of the jobs and I went full time at the second job, working mostly days <coughs> and some nights. Um, and it was around this time that I got a permanent impairment payout. Um, so I'd got put at about 31% whole person impairment. Um, I went through, bought a house, and moved into the house by myself. I was like, awesome. Basically cut all communication with everyone once I moved into the house. Um, so I bought the house on the first, I moved into the house on the 1st of December. On the 8th of December, I went to the M&M concert in Sydney. And while I was at the M&M concert in Sydney towards the end of the night, I got pushed down a set of stairs by a security guard. Um, and then on the way out, further down, just before we got to the gates, I was thrown to the ground so violently that it ripped my jumper and shirt. Um, it was after this that I was like, oh, something doesn't feel right, I probably should call an ambulance. Um, and I got taken to the hospital and I lost feeling in my leg for five to six hours that night. Um, and they did some CT scans and they found out that I had a lump in my neck um, and the swelling from the being violently thrown to the ground and then pushed that swelling which had cut my spinal cord off, cut the nerves to my spinal cord again and that, that's what caused the loss of feeling. Um, once the swelling went down I got all feeling back but it scared me so much that I started to really think about what I needed to do when I went out and I became a lot more timid when I was out. I was already pretty timid but I definitely became a lot more timid when I was out and not at work. Um, 
it was during this time that I got into a really big pattern of working, drinking, substance abuse to feel better. Um, I met my now wife during this time, which was the best thing that happened as when she finished high school, she decided to go to uni. Um, she wanted to do medicine, but we settled on her doing paramedics and we moved out to Bathurst. Um, me living in Western Sydney just wasn't working. I was drinking more and I needed to, ch I needed the change. Um, so we moved out to Bathurst for three years, um, purchased my second and third property. So I purchased my second property just before we moved to Bathurst and my third property when we did move to Bathurst. Um, I'd always looked forward to retiring early and I figured property was the best way to do it. Um, out at Bathurst, my mental health kind of peaked and troughed and it was kind of all over the place. We were really isolated out there. We had no family. We had no friends when we moved there. We only had, my, had work people and work wasn't the most welcoming place to outsiders at that point. There were some people that made a really good effort and it was great, but the other people just enjoyed their little circles of friends. Um, the boss out there had an interesting way of talking to people and it really took it, it really affected me because one day he basically impersonated how I was walking at the time and was like, you're never gonna get promoted in this company because you walk too slow and you walk funny. Um, and he, he knew that I had a disability at this point. Um, so after that, I went and seen a doctor and Bell's medical training had kind of picked up a little bit by them. So she was more aware of my injury and what needed to be done to treat it. <coughs> um, when we were talking to the doctor about my injury and mental health, he decided to put me on antidepressants um, Baclofen for my spasms and Lyrica, which helps with neuropathic pain, which put me in a better mood by by um, being on the medications. Part of the deal of being on the antidepressants though was that I had to stop drinking, so I opted to take medication for three months, three to six months, to help me stop drinking, which was really good, and I felt great when I stopped drinking. So I joined a gym for the first time in six or seven years. Um, and started back at the gym and I was feeling really good. The only thing that I hated was just, I hated going to work. It was, so we looked around and I found another job. Um, just before I did find the job, I had a friend out there that asked me to go to the gym with him. And we ended up going to the gym every day for months on end. Sometimes we even figured out that we'd be able to go two times a day for a month just to see whether we could get on like the uh, most attended board which we actually did and that was our goal um, and my recovery went really well during this time I was putting on really good muscle I felt stronger I felt, felt fitter I was able to do more my mental health was going really well um, and it was at this time that I got married to my now wife in a magical wedding um, where no one had phone reception, it was brilliant. So no one was off taking phone calls or texting or involved in anything else or Facebooking. <coughs> the whole night was just about us and mingling with friends and people that supported us. Um, from there, my son Ashton was born in 2016. And prior to him being born, I had my first wedding anniversary and I had a friend come from Sydney and I don't know why, but we started drinking and then I just got into a mood to go to the pub. And when we ended up at the pub, I ended up feeling bad. So I found some ecstasy um, and took it and then I continued drinking and I just felt great for a bit. And then about two hours afterwards, I just felt so bad and so miserable. Um, and I'm, happy, I'm glad to say that that was the last ever time that I took any kind of substance that isn't alcohol. Um, and it even stopped me wanting to drink as much because I don't remember much after feeling bad about it, but I was out for another four hours, apparently. Um, after my son was born, we <clears throat> decided that we were going to move to Queensland to be closer to Belle's family. Um, <clears throat> and it was at this time that I figured that I'd sell some houses to have some cash and spend some time at home with Ashton. <coughs> um, I sold my original house in South Windsor and then the, the second house I had bought, I had bought it for a friend because she was 
in a tight spot and needed a house out at Canoundra where she wanted to live. So I bought the house for her. And every time that I went to visit her, the house was getting more and more damaged. Um, and I was going to renovate the house, that was a plan, but as she damaged it more and more, my, my want to continue upgrading the house just became less and less. <coughs> um, when I went out to do like the final inspection when she was moving so that I could figure out what I was going to do, I walked into the house and a dog had eaten the door, a door, eaten um, architraves. There was feces all over a wall where they locked the door. There were, a laundry was just covered in paw prints and feces and the dog had eaten anything he could get to. <clears throat> she had a son at the time and she'd allowed the son to draw on every single wall in the house. There was stuff stuck to the floor that I couldn't get off and I ended up having to sand off um, so there was about $8,000 worth of damage to the house done that I had to repair and after that I just sold the place straight away. I couldn't deal with it. Um, and this was somebody that had supported me pretty well throughout the accident and then after I had kind of got her a house she fell away from the support. Um, after we moved to Queensland, it became very clear that Queensland wasn't for us. It's too hot, too humid, and I did not enjoy it. Um, my wife applied for a job down here, which she got, um, and we moved down to Melbourne in the April of 2017. Um, it was at this time that I decided to start to get back in contact with WorkHub and have my case reopened. <clears throat> um, and start to see specialists and take the correct medications and really take a hold of my recovery and be the best person that I could. Um, not just for me, but I had a son now. So I wanted to be able to go and play football with my son and run with my son when he's older and be really involved in his life. And how I, the way that my body was at that point, I just couldn't do it. Um, so I started to see specialists, I started to see some physios down here, I <clears throat> um, went to see a urologist and try and get my bladder, um, get my bladder sorted out. Um, and that, I was with that care team for about a year and then in the October, in that October I moved to where I currently reside and I had to change my whole care team. Um, it was during this time that I, I stayed with the same doctor and same specialist, but I had to find a new, I found a new physio at Soaring Health, um, and I'd see them twice a day doing Pilates and just general exercises to <coughs> increase my muscle tone. Um, and ever since I had the accident, I always wanted to use my story to give back to people. So my wife found me a course in Allied Health Assistant, which sounded perfect because I'd be able to find a job and help people that would, had been injured. And if they were down, I'd be able to tell them my story and hopefully pick them up and show them that they can be better. Um, and so while I was doing my course, I, was, I really got back into my fitness, which had been a big part of my life prior to my accident. I'd always played football or soccer. Um, I'd been training for Muay Thai and kickboxing for 18 months or so. I was at the gym almost five days a week, three hours each day. And my job was <coughs> cutting Giprox, so I was really physical when I was working. <coughs> um, and I figured fitness was a good way to get my head back <coughs> into a good spot. So I started swimming. I started swimming five or 600 meters a day um, just at a nice slow pace, it took me like 44 minutes the first time and I just slowly increased it from there um, until I got to a point where it was hurting too much. So I realized that the turning and the breathing was what was causing the problem. So I found a way to fix that. I went and got some, got a snorkel and I got some um, float, like some flotation devices for my legs to keep my legs up. and. I started swimming further with less pain with the aids while my muscles recovered and I found that worked really well. So before COVID hit, I swam three or four times a week and I was up to swimming a cane about 16 to 17 minutes at that point. Um, 
whilst doing my allied health course as well. Um, in December last year, I did my placement with Soaring Health and really enjoyed what I did. Um, I thought I was going to enjoy the physio side of it more because I've always been more interested in the physio, but I really loved doing the occupational therapy side of it. Um, such a wide range of people. Um, so that, that finished just before Christmas. <laughs> And then in January this year, I started to see a new psychologist. I'd been seeing one for a while down here, but <clears throat> he became really hard to see. So I was like, it's time for a change of psychologist. I need someone that I can see when I'm available. Um, I started to see a psychologist that was specialized in PTSD and anxiety. And he also had a history of dealing with people whose, whose parents have PTSD, which worked really well for me. Um, we, we did a thing called um, eye movement desensitization, I think it is, um, where basically they kind of hypnotize you and you relive what's upsetting you and what's causing issues. So I did two sessions on my accident um, and during the time I had to be convinced that I could stand. I was so convinced that I couldn't move my legs. Um, but afterwards, and when I stood up, it felt like the weight of the world had been lifted off my shoulders. Um, and it changed the way that I see the world. Um, so anyone that's struggling, I do really recommend it, or you at least give it a try. Um, with the way COVID hit, I couldn't swim as much, so I started bike riding. Um, and I've continued bike riding. So this morning I did a 40K bike ride <clears throat> to clear my head. Um, and I try to ride 40Ks three or four times a week at the moment just to keep fit and active. Um, and when I was able to go back to swimming, I was swimming three days a week and I was doing one and a half Ks just to continue with my recovery. Um, and that leads me to work my job. So I now work for Soaring Health as an allied health assistant. I do a bit with the physios, a bit with the OTs, the psychologists, the speech therapists. Um, my role is really big actually. I get to work with all of them and I get to work on a varying scale of people and disabilities and it's really rewarding to be able to help people and for some of them I shared my story for the first time with a client the other day and I got and it was really good and uplifting to see them respond to it and be able to and for them to see that they can move forward with their life. Um, so yeah, that kind of brings me to the end, I guess. Um, some points that I probably missed is to make sure that you've got good support people around you. I had support with me all the time. Um, there were definitely ebbs and flows with my family where they were supporting me or I didn't feel like they were supporting me and I had different friends around that were supporting me. Um, but when I had the accident, I also had a lot of friends walk away because they just didn't know how to deal with me with the accident. So. Some people that I thought were my closest friends and would support me through anything just completely walked away. And I tried to chase them and it was the biggest mistake I ever made. If people walk away from supporting you, just let them. There's always someone else there out there that will support you. Um, my wife is obviously my biggest supporter at the moment and is quite happy to pull me up when I'm being silly, but also encourage me to move forward. Um, Pain, unfortunately, is a part of recovery. Um, you've just got to continue doing the recovery and eventually the pain stops or subsides, so I've found. Um, so yeah, I will leave that there and thank you for everyone listening. Um, and I hope you have a good night.